Good morning. Welcome again to Victory Family Church. Thanks for being here. Uh, those of you watching online, uh, I, I know as some of the COVID numbers increase, more and more people watch online. And I don't care where you watch it from. I'm grateful for you. Uh, you can be a part of the church family from uh, wherever you're at. Uh, also grateful for you being here today in the house. Uh, good to have you. Last week we started a sermon series called Uncle Bob, and um, I yelled more than I anticipated last week, but I uh, hope it was, it was helpful. And then uh, next week, we're going to continue in, in that series, but today, uh, we're taking a, just kind of a, a break from it. Uh, last Sunday was um, Orphan Sunday uh, across the United States of America. Uh, hundreds, if not thousands of churches participated in an Orphan Sunday because of uh, just some, some circumstances that we decided to, to do it uh, today instead of instead of last week. And so something is, is pretty cool when we can uh, collectively as a church across the country come together and say, hey, there is a, there's a crisis in our, in our country. We can come together and we can make an impact and help kids that need to be in foster care or, or adopted. And, and listen, it's a massive crisis. Over 400,000 children in America are waiting to be adopted right now. I know, like, that number seems overwhelming, so let's just look at Oklahoma. In Oklahoma, there's 3,387, and then there's 137 in Cleveland County. So, like, like, it seems overwhelming, but then the smaller it gets, the more you realize, hey, maybe we can make a difference. But well, right now, only, only just, just under 500 kids in the state of Oklahoma, and only 26 in Cleveland County are ready to be adopted at this moment. And so when I look at that, I think, I don't say this in, like, a weird, cool way, but I think, like, over 5,000 people attend this church. Only 26 kids need to be adopted. I just kind of feel like we can do that. Uh, we, can, we can take care of every single kid in our community. Uh, anybody like you're real good at Rubik's Cube? Anybody real good? Real good? Pretty good? Pretty good? What's your, time? What's your best time? You time it? Two minutes? There's one. No, I'm not trying to one-up you, man. I, I can't do it. I can't do it. There's one guy last, last worship training. He was sitting up at the top. I didn't even ask him the time. That's why I asked you the time. Uh, can, you, can you beat two minutes? What, what's your fastest? 120? Oh, I'm not even making this up. You're going to think I'm making what I'm about to say. You're thinking I'm making this up. The guy screamed from the balcony. I said, anybody do a Rubik's Cube? He said, I said, you up there? I didn't ask him the time. He said, one minute, 19 seconds. He got you by one second. He got you by one second. I'm not making that up. <laughs> And, and he, he's proud of it. Like, I, like I, I get a Rubik's Cube and I look at it. I try to, like, I try to figure it out. I try. And like, like my one minute, 20 seconds goes by pretty quick. And it still looks the same as it did when I got it. And then two minutes go by, it looked the same. And I get so frustrated. What I do is I take the Rubik's Cube and I put it up and I never even try it again. Because I'm frust- it's a problem that is out of my mental capacity. I had a friend, though. He's like, I, I can teach you how to do it, man. You just start at the bottom. You this, this, this. And I was like, I don't even actually care that much. I know. It's just stupid, right? And I think, I think a, a lot of times we treat the crisis, the fatherless home, the motherless home, the, the orphan crisis in America, we treat it kind of like a Rubik's Cube. A lot of us, we look at it and we say, we're trying to help. We're trying to fix. We're trying, but we don't necessarily know how. And then all of a sudden, we look at it, we process it, and we realize it's frustrating. I can't figure it out. And so I'd rather just ignore it and walk away and focus on something else. But there was a, a Jen Wiley who's on our, on, our, on our staff. She came to me over a year ago and said, I think, I, think, I, think we can, I think we can fix some stuff. I think we can make a tremendous impact. And so her and, and her team have been working for over a year now, and almost, it almost feels like, I'm not saying we can fix the, uh, the, the orphan crisis in, 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 in two minutes or a minute in, in 20 seconds, but, and they're brilliant, and they've been working very, very, very hard, and now I, I have so much confidence that we can fix it in our own community. Uh, the, the church in America can solve the problem. There's over, over 300,000 churches in America, and there's over 400, or not 400, there's over 4,000 churches just in Oklahoma. So we just talked about, so in, in Oklahoma, there's 3,387 kids that need to be adopted. There's 4,000 churches. Like, again, I'm not great at the Rubik's Cube. I'm not the, 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 the smartest mathematician in the world, but that tells me if every church would adopt one kid, problem solved. It seems much more simple if everybody would just step up and do something. And today I'm going to focus a little bit more on Oklahoma and, and our community, but I do want to be really careful at the beginning of this. Uh, I don't want to diminish anybody that has adopted internationally. And 
you adopt from whatever God has called you to adopt. Jesus loves somebody from the other side of the planet the exact same as he loves somebody in our own backyard. One is not better than, than the other. The only thing I think is that God strategically placed us in this community, and so we're going to make sure we're helping this community as well as helping those around, around the world. And the only time, because I hear people say stuff like, why would you adopt from overseas if there's kids in your own neighborhood that need to be adopted? That only comes from people that have never adopted or given to adoption or helped anybody in their life. I'm just saying, that's, that's where that statement comes from. And me and Chris are probably going to adopt and probably be overseas, not because we think they're better, but because we feel like that's what God's called us to do. I just want to encourage you to just do what God has called you to do. The Bible doesn't just suggest that we get involved. Scripture demands it. 30 different places in Scripture, it talks about the fatherless and, 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 and the orphan. In James chapter 1, verse 27, it says, Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless, which I just kind of feel like as we worship, that'd probably be the thing that we should look for, right? To look after orphans and widows in their distress and keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this. We're not good at either one of these things. Looking after the orphans and, and widows in their distress, we're, we're clearly not. There's 400,000 in the United States. We're not good at that. And then keep oneself from being polluted by the world. We're even worse at that. The word religion in the Greek, it, it means putting action to your faith. I know sometimes the word religion gets a bad. We're not under religion. We're in relationships, and I preach that. And I, but in this context, it just means putting action to your faith. It's what you do with what you believe. It means we don't just talk about it, post it, celebrate it, but we actually do something about it. James chapter 1, verse 22, it says, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in the mirror. And after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. Be like me going, brushing my teeth this morning and walking away, thinking I got a full head of hair and a clean shaven face. Just, it ain't right. It ain't true. I'll probably shave soon. Well, this ain't coming back to. Actually, I don't know if Buck's to her. Somebody's giving me another cream to try. I've tried about every one, but some dudes tell me just get the transplant. That's too expensive. I don't want to do that. Like, <sighs> razor. I don't want to, bro, you're like, you, I don't feel like, I don't feel like, I feel like I'm, I'm the only one that should be talking right now. I'm just saying, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'll get you a mic for the one o'clock. You can come. We'll just do it together. We'll preach together. <laughs> but whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they've heard, but doing it will be blessed What in what they do. James 2, verse 16 to 19, it says, If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed. That's what we do as followers of Christ. We're like, hey, we wish you the absolute best. Hope, hope nothing but great things happen for you. But, that's, but it says, but does nothing about their physical needs. What good is it? In the same way, faith by itself is not accompanied by action, is dead. I mean, stop talking about it unless you're willing to do something. That's not me, that's scripture. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is no, you believe there is one God, good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. Just because you believe in God doesn't mean anything. What do you do about it? All these passages, they, they speak to faith in action. Look, I am very pro-life, but we cannot just be pro-life when the baby is in the, in the womb and stop caring about them the moment that they're born. I want to be pro-life to the two-year-old that is hungry. I want to be pro-life to the six-year-old in foster care. It's easy for us to post all this anti-abortion pro-life stuff. And listen, I am pro-life, but why, why do we stop caring as soon as they're born? Well, because we know that it's more about doing, and it's harder to get involved then. As a church, we're committed, and we want to express our faith to God in a pure and faultless way. The Bible tells us how to do it. Don't be polluted by the world and help the orphans and the widows. It says, it says look after, and like, look after is the act of engaging in it. Dads, I'm going to just talk to the dads. You ever been somewhere like maybe a Target or just going to be really general here, the indoor soccer arena, um, 
and your wife says, can you watch the kids? And you're like, yeah, yeah, I got it. And then, and then she goes somewhere and comes back like 10 minutes later, and she says, where are the kids? And you're like, they were just right here. Like, I, sw- I swear, like, they, they can't be far. I promise you. Like, does that happen to anybody else or is that just, that just me? Yeah, thank you. Don't be liars. Get, raise your hand and help me feel better about myself. Right? I'm not the only terrible parent. I promise you. That ha- what? That's not looking after. Looking after is the act of engaging in. The Bible calls us to engage orphans and widows. Not only, like as a church, not, not only like, like, like can we get involved, we have to get involved for the sake of the kids and the sake of the gospel. There's a lot of families in, in our church that have adopted or fostered. And today we want to share uh, their story, but I wanted you to hear from, from them. So check out this video. Hi, my name is Mark Hyde. This is my wife, Candace. I'm Jen Wiley, and this is my husband, Benny Wiley. My name is Greg Wagner. This is my wife, Candace. My name is Tracy Jones. I'm Jamie. I'm Nick. This is Tara, and we're the Lawsons. We have uh, Keegan, who is seven, and Eliana, who is almost two. Our daughter, Eliana, we adopted her last year. We have three children, Will, who's 13, Cooper, who is 10, and Charlotte, who is six. Charlotte is six years old. Uh, She is from the Democratic Republic of Congo. We have three kids. Um, We've got twin boys. They're 14. And we have our little girl who is six, almost seven, Hope. We have four girls, ages um, 21, 17, seven, and six. We have uh, four kids. Three are biological, then Ty is a third grader, and Ty is adopted. We adopted him a few years ago, and then we have one extra right now through foster care, um, and his name is Logan, and he's in third grade also. We were fostering, had several different placements. Uh, One of them was a very long placement, and as soon as we had this young man come into our home we just knew that it was it was our time to um, adopt and but then also with that we also knew that it we would we would continue to foster after that as well somebody within the church knew that we were kind of on an adoption process with dhs and so they approached us and just said you know would you be interested in, in at least finding out more and meeting with this family and so at the time we weren't even thinking you know baby we were thinking uh, toddler out of diapers up moving around able to tell us what they wanted but uh, you you know, we prayed about it, we talked about it, and we said, you know, there can't, it can't hurt to get more information and see where this leads and, and just kind of be open to whatever God may have for us. Um, and so we made the connection and we met and it just clicked right away. And there were several things that just kind of proved um, as confirmation uh, that, that it was a, a good setup for us. I felt like the Lord called us to adopt um, a few years before we actually did. Um, I met a little girl from Ghana that had just come home. And when I held her, I just knew that the Lord was telling us that we had a daughter somewhere and that we needed to go get her. So I came home and told Mark that I was so excited. I was like, we're supposed to adopt this girl. And he was like, I think you misunderstood. And from that point, I just knew like I had to stop pushing him and that I needed to start praying for him. I had a group of girlfriends and we just would pray and we would pray. Um, and we were actually praying that he would be called to a specific country. I came home one night from work and I said, gosh, I don't know what it is, but uh, I can't get Haiti off my mind. I had no idea that this group of women for over a year had been praying specifically um, for a family. We thought she was in Haiti the whole time. And she wasn't, she was waiting for us on the other side of the world. And. The glorious part of it all is that it was all his timing, right? Like, she wasn't born yet when when Candace felt called. Um, She wasn't born yet when these ladies were praying for us. She wasn't born yet when I had that aha moment. She wasn't wasn't prepared, and we weren't prepared. Our hearts weren't prepared. Our home wasn't prepared. Our finances weren't prepared. Um, But God knew he had to plant that seed years in advance of her coming home. And that whole time, our daughter has always been our daughter. She's never not been our daughter. We had to do it on his time. It just was a calling that I always felt uh, for my life. I never really knew how that was going to play out. I just had to convince my husband that that's what we were doing because he was not for it from the beginning. But um, 
Thankfully, um, God worked a miracle in his heart, the facilitator that we were working with, that a birth mom was interested in us, found out that she was due on that Saturday. She was in Maryland, and at the time we lived in Texas. It was a tough, um, a tough process. Uh, I don't know, I went back and forth, and uh, just with the whole decision, I mean, I didn't even look at Hope. I mean, I walked in, I saw her in the hospital, I looked at her, I said, okay, we're going to the hotel. And once we got her to our hotel, I have pictures. No, of, no, no, no. You, you, you had to shower, and you're like, you have to hold the baby. I sort I, of forced I, I it have to them. shower. And I said, fine, whatever. And uh, It was a hospital shower for three and, days. And so I I've mean, got a picture on. of her, like the first time I held her, and I mean, she looked at me and... And, and that, was, that yeah. was it. Yeah. yeah. That, was, that was it, yeah. I told Jamie, I was like, this is something I feel really led to do, and Jamie's heart wasn't quite led there um, at that time. So in 2008, right. he went to Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan. Uh, I was led to go very first time out of the country, and lo and behold, uh, he broke me down. At, at that time, Jamie was like, okay, I'm on board, let's do this. The things kind of went stagnant for us. We were raising our oldest two. It was in 2011. Mm -hmm. Some good friends of ours that we actually went to school with uh, that live about two blocks away in our neighborhood yeah. um, started talking to us and pouring into us and, and basically, you know, waking us up to the fact that, you know, why, why are you, you know, dragging your feet? They were seeking to adopt a couple of kids that they had been fostering for a bit. The bio of those two kids was pregnant. So we picked her up when she was less than 24 hours old um, from the hospital, and then her little sister was born 14 months later. So they have their sisters, their older sisters, um, Maddie and Claire, and then they also have seven siblings. And so three of the siblings live in our neighborhood, and so they play with um, all three of them often. And we wrapped up a frame and he unwrapped that on Christmas morning. Um, and that's how he found out that he was, we were gonna end up being his forever home. That's when we could see a, a big change in him. After we got through that point, I think that, that stability and he knew that it was going to be forever made a huge, huge difference. And that's why we knew that, again, it's just confirmation from God that, that we knew that for whatever reason, he was the one. It's really neat to see how this whole journey has impacted not not just our oldest, but then all of our kids and their relationships and how they built relationships with these with these kids that come into our homes and they're and they're broken and how they just love on they just love on people and that's just you know that's what that's what you want as a parent is to have your kids that are on this journey with you to be able to do that as well. If you have an expectation of what it's going to look like, you can totally miss mm -hmm. the uh, miracles that he wants to do in your life. You know, I think if you're asking like why, you know, people should adopt, I mean, don't ask the old me because the old me would have said no. You can't say as much more, I mean, that's my daughter. I mean, like I love her and there is no difference. You know, you, you really think, will you be able to love these kids as your yeah. own? And without a doubt. Yeah. Um, yeah. You do. We got the call but and it was like an instant just. It was, okay, it we, was like yeah. that, you yeah. know. I think definitely if God has called you into it, then that's exactly where you need to be. Anytime God calls you into something, you just need to say yes and let Him take care of the steps that follow. One of the things I've held on to in those hard moments with these kids is that we know that God has called us into it. And anything God's called us into it, He will see us through it. If it weren't hard, everybody would do it. He said it's the hard that makes it great. And that's, that's this. I mean, it's, it's hard, but the hard is what makes this great to do. Um, and it's so awesome. Um, it's so rewarding and it's challenging and it, and it will push you and, and, and it's maddening. But, but in the end, it's, it's, it's what God's called us to do and, and we just do it the best we can. It's just so important that it's so much bigger than just bringing someone into your home. Like adoption is not the only thing that can be done. And there's so much more to do and He's already told us to do it. We just need to do it. And is it scary? Yeah, adopting from Congo was one of the craziest, scariest things that we've ever done, but there is nothing that grew my faith like that. Yeah, Watching true. the Lord tear down walls and build bridges and, and allow her to come into our family, 
is a miracle. And there are people who walked alongside us that got to witness that. And if our daughter could do that for someone else, the ripple effect from that could be huge. I think it's incredible to see not just the impact it has on the on the kids, but also on the parents and the and the siblings. Um, and so, as a church, again, like I said, Jen really been spreading this thing for for over over a year. And so, t- today is a really big, exciting day for us because uh, today we're actually launching an outreach called Chosen. And so, this is this is this is going to be a huge part of the future of our church. Everybody, uh, you got one of these when you. Uh, when you came in, oh, yep, you got one of these when you came in, and and I'm not gonna go go through it, but it just it just can kind of tell you, hey, this is this is the goal, and, and again, our, you know, here in this campus, we're gonna start with our our county. I can't remember what is what county is Chickasha? Is it Grady? What is it? Grady? That's what. Yeah, that's what I thought. Uh, I think there's only one kid in Grady County that's ready to be adopted. And so I thought, come on, we're gonna like we, we got we gotta take care of that. I don't know, I, I don't I don't know the the stats in Chickasha. I don't even know. Is that McLean County, Chickasha? Let's just pretend like it is, since you guys don't know. Um, I don't know, but like I, I feel like we can we can take care of that. Like we can make a difference. Uh, we're working with uh, an organization called Backyard Orphans, and, and here's a cool thing. Uh, but they're they're incredible, and they've been doing this for, for years, and they're kind of helping us uh, develop Chosen and, and, and walking alongside with us in this process. And so, and they take and they, they look at the 140 million orphans in the world. They break it down. Now, here's what we have in the United States. But then w- w- what they're helping us do is let's work with all the government agencies. Let's, let's work with all the nonprofits, let's work with the mission agencies, and let's figure out how to get these kids in godly, Christ-centered homes. So Chosen, now working with Backyard Orphans, becomes the bridge between the child and the new home. So s- several ways that, that you can get involved, several ways you can make an impact first, and obviously is to actually adopt. The hundreds of uh, kids in our community is waiting on, on you, and it's not just that, that your life will be forever changed. Theirs will. Like, your life will be changed. You'll be better because of it. But think about not just that child, but generation after generation after generation. You're changing a legacy. Adopting kids is saving lives and raising up generations of followers of Jesus that I believe can change the world. Take those 400,000 kids. Let's just say if the church would step up and 400,000 kids would now be raised in godly environments to go out and change the world. We can talk all we want about uh, this is how we change the country. This is how we change. If we just do this, if we would just vote this, if we would stand up for this, you want to change our country? Adopt 400,000 kids and raise them to love Jesus. It's a lot harder than a Facebook post, I guess. If we don't adopt, we're going to continue a cycle that's devastating to children in our community. There's kind of a timeline of how things work and starts at birth like I said we're extremely pro-life we believe in the sanctity of life in the womb and, and as a church man, we, we engage in fighting human trafficking we're passionate about that we engage in helping homeless and we're passionate about that we have ministry in, in prisons and small groups in prison and we're we're passionate about that, but somewhere along the way, it feels like our church, it feels like most churches, it feels like we, we, we kind of live our, our outreach outside of the lines. So we're, we're good there, and we're, we're good here, and we're, we're trying our, our best, but somehow we, we forget about inside the lines. I was studying and looking at some of this stuff, and it's, some of these statistics are astounding. According to Backyard Orphans, most states determine the number of beds in prison based on the number of kids in foster care. That doesn't make you sick. I know it will. Over 80% of the kids that are trafficked 
in the United States come from the foster care system. So we can look at what you say, man, let's stop human trafficking. And it's, man, we can post about it, we can support it, we can, like, we can do all that we want. But instead of starting there, now we're going to keep fighting. But instead of starting there, why don't we start with foster care? 80% come from there. 80% of inmates were in the foster care system. So we can, we can, we can, keep, we can keep doing prison ministry, and we will. We're, we're going to keep helping people. We're going to keep supporting. We're going to keep doing the best we can. But what if we just adopted? A fourth of foster care alumni will become involved in the criminal justice system within two years of leaving foster care. Two years. 90% of teenagers that have been a five or more foster placement will enter the justice system. So, so obviously, obviously we need to keep doing what we're doing outside the lines. But, church, we, gotta, we want to make a difference in the country. We want to make a difference in people's lives. It's going to be easier to fix those problems when it's 20% of what it is now because we've already taken care of this problem. If, if the church doesn't step up and get involved and fix the, the, the upstream between the, the two lines... And we're just going to continue to feed the things on my left. Adoption, it doesn't only save lives, it will enhance your family. It will teach your biological children how to, how to love in a way that's indescribable. Everybody is better when we adopt. Frankly, God has mandated for us to take care of the orphans. The second way you get involved is, is foster care. And here's the, the, the goal of foster care is always reunification with the biological family. And sometimes that's hard for followers of Christ. Because sometimes when you foster, you start feeling like, well, we can raise this kid in a healthier, more Christ-centered environment than what we're sending them back to. It becomes difficult. But let me tell you what's happened. I've seen several families in our church, not just one or two, several families in our church that when they're fostering, they, they've invited biological families to church and biological moms this has been happening for years. A biological mom comes and she gives her life to Jesus and, begin, and she begins serving the Lord. And now all of a sudden, foster parent begins to disciple a biological parent. Every single week, we have, we have foster parents that attend church with, with biological families and they, and they bring the kids. And, and it's been incredible to see. We're fixing the upstream. So we created Chosen. This incredible outreach, and I say we like I had a lot to do with it. I said a lot. That's about it. That's about all I had to do with it. But we we created that so you could help fulfill God's call on your life. And a lot of what it is is to to take out all the red tape and just make an easier connection between you and your child. And I'm not like I'm not saying everybody should everybody should adopt or foster. There are some people that I know, like they, they should never have, like never procreated in the first place. Like there are, like let's just be real. Like there's some people like maybe you just, you know. <laughs> so it ain't for everybody. And they don't come to this service. They came to the other ones for sure. Everyone here, I'm happy that you procreated. It's great. So you may not should adopt. <laughs> you might not should foster, but you can do something. Everybody can do something, and that's, and that's the, the, the last component is simply supporting. There's so many different ways to, to support. Obviously, there's a, a big financial component. Adopting a kid on, on the very, very, very low end costs $5,000. That's a lot of money. But oftentimes, up thirty, forty, even $50,000 to adopt a child. If you, if you do it through uh, fostering, then that, that number goes down significantly. And, and some people, man, God is not tugging on your heart to, to maybe help or, or maybe to uh, uh, adopt a kid. Maybe God's not tugging on your heart to, to foster, but maybe God is tugging on your heart to help somebody financially who, 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 who is. And that's, like, that's how God has blessed you. The, the gift of generosity is a gift from the Lord. The Bible, the Bible says God calls some to teach. Some to be generous. Maybe, and many other things, maybe the gift that God has given you is the gift of generosity. And in 1 Peter 4.10, it says, everyone, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Here's what's really sad. 
the only thing that's holding a lot of people back from adopting and, and fostering is they just don't have the financial resources. And, but here's the beauty of the body of Christ. That's why I love the body of Christ. One person can say, God is calling me to adopt. And another person is saying, God is not calling me to adopt, but God has blessed me. And I know that I'm blessed to be a blessing, so I'm going to help. And this is what happens. This is when the church comes together and we can say, I'm going to help you adopt. And together, we're fulfilling the purpose that God has put on our lives. And some of you think, I'm not in a place right now where I can financially support. There's a lot of ways to support. Maybe for some of you, you say, no, we're going to give foster parents a night off. We're going to give parents that have adopted, we're going to give them a night off. We're just going to, we're going to provide child care. We're going to babysit their kids. Or some of you, like, I'll, I'll, let's just be really honest. You saw Jen Wiley in the, in the video. She's white, okay? You want to just, just be real today? She's white. I don't know if you noticed that. I think it's awkward when I talk about it. It's, it is what it is. Her daughter, her, her daughter's black. A lot, a lot of white folks, they don't, they, they don't know how to do black people's hair. And so it's a, it's a massive insecurity. And so there's another lady in the church that she's going to start doing hair. And she's been doing hair for a lot of adoption and, 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 and foster kids for years in the church. It's just something that she can say, I can help. Some of you say, well, I, I, I can't do hair. Uh... Some of you admit, you know, I'm not, I'm not good at the, watching the kids thing. I wouldn't work out. But you can pray. Sincerely get on your knees and pray for these families and pray for these ch- children every single day. Some of you, God has, God has blessed you with, 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 with some handyman skills. You can say, I can help. Man, whether, it's, whether it's in the, in the foster system or this adopted family, man, I, I, I can use my skills. For some, maybe you're, you're good at CPR or other training. You can come in and you can help do trainings. Some of you... You say, I can't do any of that, but you can cook a meal. Somebody say, I can't cook. You can you know how to use postmates. Like you just you can figure something out, right? Order a meal, it's fine. I I'll never forget when when I brought my son home. We'd been in the hospital for, for three days, and frankly, I was exhausted. It'd been a long three days for me. <laughs> so bring my what are y'all laughing at? Hey, I've had a kidney stone before. I know what y'all been through, ladies. I know, I know, I know y'all been through. <laughs> Stupid. <laughs> Twice, actually. So we're pretty equal. Like, you've had two kids, I've had two kidney stones. It's the same. So we had, we had my son and his little, uh, don't send me an email, I'm kidding. Uh, we, we had him in his car seat. We put him down. It was, I'll never forget it. It was OU, uh, OU football game later that day. It was a Saturday morning. We brought him home from the hospital. He has a little OU beanie on, a little OU shirt. He was ready to roll. You're a little fan. And, and we sat down on the couch, and Christy said, Christy said right here, I was sitting right here, a little Beckham right in the middle of us. I looked at Christy. I looked at him. I looked at Christy, I looked, and I started crying. Not because, like, I was overwhelmed with this bundle of joy. I, I, I didn't know what to do. <laughs> like, what do we do now? Like, he's, do we take him out of the car? Like, what are we supposed to do? Where's the nurse? I don't know what to do. Are you supposed to feed him? Like, what are we doing? Like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't want to touch him. Not, not because I, did, I, didn't, I didn't love him. Like, I was afraid I'd break him. Like, how do I pick him up? How do I, I didn't know anything. I didn't go to any of those classes. I was like, I don't need those classes. I'll figure it out. I get him home. I needed one of those classes. But it was great that so many people came around us and, and helped us. It was great that that night we didn't have to worry about cooking, cooking dinner. Somebody brought it to us. So I don't know what gift God has given you, but I want to encourage you. He gave that gift to you for a reason. That's to use it to, to love and help his people. So whatever God has given you, I want to encourage you and use it to help. The theme of orphans in Scripture is that God doesn't want them to remain orphans. We're called to step up church. We are called to help. So here's the thing. I know this is a very different message than normal. Here's the thing. If, if you're even thinking about it, you're thinking maybe possibly fostering or adopting is, is for me. Uh, there's a bunch of tables in the lobby just straight directly as you, as you, as you leave. And there's a Zoom call at 4 o'clock this, this afternoon. Again, there's no commitment. It's just saying, hey, I'm interested. 
I know there's some of you that you're, you're already fostering or you've already adopted, and your thought process, I wish you would have had this a few years ago. Well, listen, like, we're here for you now. Like, oh, I'm sorry we didn't have a few years ago. We're here for you now. So I want you to go back. You can sign up. We want to we wanna come alongside you now. Or if you would just say, man, I want to help. I want to, like, I want to support. If you want to financially support, we'll take up an offering in a little bit and just write chosen in the in the memo, if there's these other ways that you want to support, you say, I can help with hair. I, I, can, I can help with meals. Man, I can help babysit. Then just go sign up and say, I want to help somehow, some way. Church, listen, we can, we can fix a problem. I'm going to tell you what I'm tired of. This is going to give me a lot of trouble. I'm tired of prayer meetings and worship services. We cry out to God. We say, send this revival. We say, change our country. While we blatantly ignore what he's actually called us to do. It's really easy to pray big prayers. And I'm not against worship service. I promise you, we're not going to stop those. I'm not against prayer. I'm not going to stop that. Because those things are the most important things we do, but they're worthless if we're not putting action to our faith. The Bible's clear, man. It's don't just hear God's word. Do something. Man, let's not be a goers to church. Let's, let's be doers of the word of God. Heavenly Father, we, we love you and we're grateful for you. God, help us to do. God, Lord, help us to do the things you've called us to do. God, you've gifted this church and you've blessed this church. God, so we can be a blessing to our community and those all over the planet. God, help us help people. Move on our hearts today. With your heads bowed and eyes closed, I know it's a little bit of a different sermon than, than normal, but I also know that there's still people in this room that you don't have a relationship with your Heavenly Father. Maybe you're not an orphan, but maybe you're a spiritual orphan. You've sinned, which means you're separated from God. But today you would say, I want to accept God as my Father. I want to accept Jesus as my Savior. See, we have a Father that sent His Son to earth to live like this perfect life, and then he died this like unthinkably miserable death on a cross. Why would a father that loves his son do that? Because he loved you so much. He wanted to forgive you of your sin. And he wanted you to spend eternity with him. Then three days later, God rose again. Jesus sits on the right hand of the Heavenly Father as your advocate. He died for you, and now he's your advocate. He wants nothing more than to forgive you, to give you a fresh start, a new life, and ultimately a new eternity with Him in heaven. And if you're here, and you'd say, I want to be adopted into the family of God. I want to follow, I want to follow Jesus. I want to be forgiven of my sins. I want to begin walking with the Lord. If that's you across this room, will you just slip your hand up in the air? I want to be forgiven. I want to walk with Jesus. Thanks right here. Everybody pray this prayer together with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the sacrifice of the cross. Thank you for the resurrection. I know that I've sinned. I don't want to sin anymore. I don't want to live for myself anymore. I want to live for you. I want to follow you. I want to walk with you. I don't want my life to be my own. I want it to be yours. You are my Savior. I love you and I thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks so much for jumping on our YouTube page. My name is Adam. I'm the pastor here at Victory Family Church. This is my wife, Christy. Uh, I just want to say welcome to the family. We talk about family a lot here. Now you're a part of the family on YouTube. And so hopefully the content here will help you, challenge you, encourage you, and maybe make you laugh a little bit. So uh, subscribe. We'd love to have you. Uh, have an awesome day.